Well, good morning, everyone. I didn't think I didn't think my headset was on because I couldn't hear it, and I realized it was all of you. I want to thank you for a good worship. You, you guys sounded great. Thank you. It was good to it was good to hear you, and uh, you know it's one thing when you're up here and you're you're kind of you're trying to worship God, but you're trying to pay attention so you don't hit a wrong note or something. And then it's another thing when you just get enveloped in the worship and you can really meet with the Lord. And uh, you guys helped me to do that this morning, so I want to thank you for that. Well, today we're going to be back in the book of Peter. But first, men's retreat will be at the end of this week. A month, sorry. Thank you very much. Keeping me straight. I love this. Yeah. The message of prophets would be judged by prophets. That's good. So that's good. September 27th and 28th, uh, that we have a sign-up sheet. If you're interested, please see the sign-up sheet or see Carl. How come I can't see Carl? He's sitting down. Yes. The tallest man in our church. Carl Vitale, most handsome head. That guy over there. That's going to be your nickname. That's going to be your mafia name now. That's handsome head. There's Jimmy DeFinger. You know, we got... Anyway, so just to let you guys know, building a man is no easy project, and God builds men in a certain way, and we're going to look at how God has done this in the past, and uh, I think you guys will really enjoy it, and you won't end up looking like that. <coughs> yeah, they actually have these things. Usually God builds us as men and builds character into our lives, character that looks like Jesus by giving us difficulties and hardships and plowing our hearts and pulling things out and planting things that belong there and uh, that this great substitutionary thing that we call sanctification, where when the Lord comes in and saves you, he makes you new, and then he just, he, he wipes the canvas clean and begins to remake you you know, takes off the smudges and the mistakes that you've made in your life and, and the Lord restores it with beauty. So uh, that's, we're going to talk about that and how God does that in the scriptures. So previously, we were in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, and I got as far as one verse. So, uh, And so I'm going to go over it briefly. I went over it uh, in depth last time. Peter is telling us that there are things about our lives that we need to put off, like clothing. You know, you, you take off your pajamas and you put on clothes to come here. I, I mean, I imagine you all did. I don't see any pajamas, but um, maybe you slept in your clothes. I doubt it. But you take, there's certain things you take off and certain things you put on. And it's not a, a self-help thing. It's we do this because God's given us a new heart. He's given us a new life. He's given us the ability to be obedient to his word where we didn't have it before because the scripture says we were dead in our trespasses and sin and we were a slave to our sinful nature. But in Christ, we're no longer a slave to our sinful nature. I don't have to do all the stupid things that I do, but sometimes I volunteer, <laughs> which is worse. So there are things that we put off and there are things that we do that we carry. There are things that we put upon ourselves that just, it, it's a heavy weight to carry. Some of us are holding on to things that we should have let go a long time ago. You know what I'm talking about? Can, can, can I be honest? Good. Because I, I, have, I have the same struggles you do. There are certain habits that, that come flying out of me. I, I, I have thoughts of, of uh, taking people out. <laughs> now, you might not have that, but I do. <laughs> You know, I learned a lot of things in the military, which I'm not allowed to use. So, but they're, they're there in case of emergency. But I think every day is an emergency. That's the problem. And so there are things that we have to unpack, things that we have to remove. And it's a, it's a willful act of worship to do so. It's not legalism. It's not um, anything else that you might call it. It is obedience to the Father. He saved us that we might reflect him. And I don't know about you, but the reflection of Jesus in me is, is not what I see in the scriptures. And so I have to soak in it 
so that I start to look more like Jesus and I put those things into practice that I see. So that's what holiness is all about. It's about being obedient to the things that the Lord's told us. And his, his commands are not burdensome to those who have a relationship, those who have an engine, racing's an exciting thing. To people that just have a chassis with no motor, it's a burdensome thing because you're pushing, right? You gotta push the car with no engine. You guys get my metaphors? Okay, because we're about to dive into some heavy stuff, so I, I'm just giving you light stuff. So this is what we look like, and very few of us walk around with empty hands because we're, we're carrying things that we shouldn't. And so he begins by saying we need to lay these things aside because they're baggage. They're things that need to be gone. Number one, malice. We talked about what malice looks like. It's about having a decidedly angry, uh, malicious, evil attitude towards somebody. And we have, uh, I, have, I have a bunch of car cartoon characters in my mind that do that. And so I put Mr. Dastardly up there on the right, uh, or Wiley Coyote. And we talked about that um, last week. There are, there are, there's malice. And he's writing to Christians. So these are things that Christians presumably have in their life, right? Malice, do you, do you ever have like ill will towards somebody? Like, then I'm going to get that guy. You, you wait. And that's what he's talking about. We've got to put that off. Because carrying that around will destroy us. It's like harboring cancer or leftovers in your refrigerator that have been there for way too long. Malice. Deceit. Deceit, where you pretend to be something you're not, where you want people to believe something else. It's, it, it, a narcissist is just wonderful at this. They will try to just play you to get you to think better of them than they really are. Um, some people think that makeup is a form of deceit. But like J. Vernon McGee said, if a barn needs paint, you should paint it. <laughs> That's the only time I quote other people when I know that Reed is angry. The word deceit, it's, it really, it's like offering a fish a meal and making the fish a meal. That's really what deceit is. You're, you're throwing something out there that looks like it's edible and you're offering a meal, but what you're doing is you're trying to fish a meal out of the water and then the fish becomes a meal. And deceit is one of those things that should not be in our lives. Pretending to be more holy than we are, to pretending to uh, do more than we do or to not be honest, just flat out honest, that needs to go. And so we got to put it off. Amen? Amen? All right. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, deceit is when you're trying to deceive somebody specifically. Hypocrisy is a way of life where you're pretending to be somebody that you're not. You're play acting. You're being a certain person um, that you think you should be or you want other people to like because they won't like you if they really see who you are. Hypocrisy is one of those things that your life just doesn't measure up to your words. When your life measure up to your words, it's called integrity. When what you say and what you do match, that's integrity. And that's what we're supposed to put on, right? So first, we've got to take off the hypocrisy. You know, I, I got to tell you, I did not wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and get on my knees and pray for four hours. I didn't do that. So I'll be quick to tell you all the things I haven't done. The things that I have done, I do secretly. It's between me and God. I hope it's the same for you. How are you doing this morning? Well, I'm a little tired. I was up at 3 a.m. praying my mind out for everyone. <laughs> why, why, why are you doing that? Why are you sharing that? I don't need to know that. Why are you telling me that? And if you ever say that to me, maybe that's what I'll say. <laughs> so you better not say it to me, I guess. Because I'm aware, and I don't want to be hypocritical. I don't want to be that guy, you know. I, I don't want to pretend to be... Uh, well, here comes Pastor Dave. Hi, how are you? You know, put on a special voice and speak in these and thous and all that. And there are people that do that. And the church is notorious for getting hypocrisy. And I think it's because people in the church sometimes become very judgmental. They look down on other people like they're less than. And there's no place for that in Christ. Because without Christ, we're all heaven. We're, heaven is off limits for us. And hell is the place where we'll live forever. So... None of us is better than anybody else. So I don't need to pretend to be anything for you because I don't necessarily need you to like me for things that really don't exist in my life. Because I have peace with God through Jesus Christ. 
It all rolls into having a right relationship with God. And then you won't pretend to be something that you're not. You'll actually be something that you want to be. And then you don't have to pretend. Hypocrisy is being worth $70 million and telling people, you know, you can't trust rich people. Which those two ladies, one is worth 70 million and the other one 3 billion. And they're telling you, you can't trust rich people. That's called hypocrisy, just in case you were wondering. Envy. Envy is wanting something that you don't have. Jealousy is wanting something that's yours. <laughs> that's different. And it says that the Lord is envious of us, of our time with him. He envies. He wants. He desires those things. But he's jealous, not envious. It's a different thing. If, if I found my wife with another man, I'd be jealous because she's my wife. If I found some other man with some other wooden woman, I shouldn't be jealous, right? I might be envious. So that's the difference. So envy. And what happens is you, you have this desire that's unfulfilled. And when you have a desire that's unfulfilled, I mean, you, you start writing stories like Romeo and Juliet, struggle they went through, this desire that's unfulfilled, this unrequited love, this unreturned love, and, and you get into abandonment and all of that stuff, making of, of good Greek, you know, tragedy. Um, somebody loved somebody, but they didn't love them back, and they loved someone else, and you get the rub, love triangles, you know, you find it on TV all the time. Envy. It's, it's wasting away. It's something rotting away inside you because you want something that you don't have, and you think you should. And so you desire it and you want it. And you know what the opposite of that is? Contentment. Contentment. What I have, I'm pleased with. It's, it's not about getting everything you want. It's about wanting everything you have. Right? You guys know this. You guys are very quiet today. And this is just a review. Evil speaking were to put away. Oh, boy, evil speaking. I'm sure you folks never have any trouble with your mouth. Uh, I mean, I have no trouble with eating, obviously, but <laughs> it's the stuff that comes out of my mouth, that comes out of my heart, that degrades me. And evil speaking is tearing down the integrity of somebody else, tearing down their reputation, tearing them down to someone else. Now, that's what we call gossip. Uh, if you do it in writing, it's called slander. And so you have to be, or libel, rather, if you do it in writing. So uh, it, it's a law suitable offense in, in a lot of places, but... There are magazines that that's all they do is gossip, right? And they're tearing down people's character and telling you deep, dark secrets about what's going on. And I mean, that's what news is made of, right? Shocking revelations. Oh, did you hear about... You see, you guys all lean forward. I just, yeah. <laughs> evil speaking is speaking evil. It's speaking evil of people, and it causes so much trouble. You can, you can start a rumor and actually watch it go around. You can actually watch it go around and you hear people repeat it back to you and you go, that's interesting. Who'd you hear that from? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. Did you ask that person about this? Well, no, I, I could never do that. Why not? <laughs> if, if somebody told you something dastardly about me, <laughs> would you just pass it on as a juicy nugget or would you come to me and say, like Carl would, he would. Hey, Dave, but I, I heard something. I, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I heard this thing. I'm just wondering. I'm sorry to bring this to you, but it, like he's very, very cautious about that kind of stuff. Other people storm in my office, put their finger in my face and assume it's true and then add to it and, and accuse me of things I've never done. So you ever have that happen? If you haven't, Brace yourself. It's coming. Because evil speaking is everywhere. And this is something that Peter, the Holy Spirit's telling us through Peter, we've got to put it off. Put it off. So I, I brought this up, the, the think thing. Any of you remember the think thing that I talked about? Before speaking, you should think, which means, and what, I, what I'm about to say, is it true? And you have to do some research before you do that, right? Is it helpful? Like, why am I sharing this? Is this going to help the other person? Is it good for their edification? Number three, is it inspiring? 
Is it something that's going to inspire them to do something good? Or it's something that's going to make them just lose all the wind in their sails and just say, oh, well, forget it. I'm not going to do anything then. I quit, you know. Is it necessary? I mean, th does everyone need to know everything in your life? This is what I imagined. I imagined you all said, no, but <laughs> because I can't read your mind. Maybe you did and I didn't hear it. Does everyone need to know everything? No. Oh, thank you. Good. Because, you know, we're supposed to carry secrets, right? Secrets because those things disclosed are going to defame other people and then we get into that evil speaking thing, right? So is it necessary that this person know what I'm about to tell them? And number four, is it kind? Is it kind? Somebody cut me off zipping down the road, that stinking so-and-so can't drive, they should get shot, they should, I should run them off the road, I, you know, I should, I should catch up to them, cut them off and have an accident and sue them. <laughs> Now, I know none of you people here in New Jersey have those thoughts. So pray for me, because sometimes I have those thoughts. I'm in a little bitty car, you know? I mean, I could die very simple, and that's good. I'll go see the Lord, but, you know, it's going to be hard for you. You've got to find somebody else to come up here and deal with all you people. Is it kind? Is it kind? So you want to go through all that. And... Now I've taken to this and I start to think about people that are rushing around like maniacs and I pray for them. Somebody cutting me off and run, you know, their, their wife is giving birth right now in their home and they've got no ride to the hospital and they're crowning. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. They're a fireman. You don't know. You don't, you have that, their house is on fire. You don't know. You don't know. So, what I want to do is be kind, you know, maybe give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, oh, so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. Have you thought about this? And just throw a possibility that maybe they don't understand. Maybe they were dropped as a child. Maybe, they, <laughs> maybe they're beaten by their wife. Maybe, like, you don't know necessarily where people are coming from or why they do the things they do, but we're so quick to judge, aren't we? And think we know. And we don't know. So we have to ask and find out if what we're thinking is true, if it's helpful, if it's inspiring, if it's needed, and if it's kind, then it can come out of my mouth. And so I try to filter everything through that. It's a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's not from the Bible, but I think it's smart. So first one we went over last week, all of the baggage and all of the things that were to put off, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. All of these things were to lay aside. And there are other scriptures that tell us that, like Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, by the way, all of those who have gone before us, who walked with God and did what was right, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the scripture encourages us to put off the stuff that we're carrying that we really shouldn't be. I've been cleaning out my garage recently, and I realize I've been storing a lot of stuff I really don't need. You guys have some of that? Yeah. <laughs> and I refuse to get a storage facility to put stuff in that I don't need anymore. So there'll be a garage sale at our house. I'll give you the date and let you know, and you can come by my junk and put it on your shelves. <laughs> So, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So, we're going to go over that this week, and hopefully we'll get all the way to verse 8. So, we're going to have to go at light speed. Newborn babes. Now, if there's anything you know about a newborn baby, is they will let you know when they're hungry. And everything about them is just so absolutely cute. I saw two ladies with two babies here today, and everyone was like, oh! They're so cute, but if they were human size, like the rest of us, they'd kill you. <laughs> they would. 
Because when they want something, they want something, and they don't, they don't care if they tear your face off or rip your esophagus out. They don't care. They don't understand consequences. And so that's the way that it is. But everything about them is just absolutely wonderful, except what, what comes out of them. <laughs> Their mouths. Because they weep and they cry. Yeah, the other end's not so great either, but... We are to be like newborn babes in the fact that we should crave spiritual food, the word of God. That's really good advice. And yet, so many of us don't mind missing meals. <laughs> and we're supposed to desire the pure milk of the word. You know, reading is one of those things that just seems so inconvenient and so old school now. Because, well, we have electronic devices that we spend hours on every day, right? Yeah. So I don't know about you, but I have, I have like a whole load of devotionals and stuff. And, but after a while, I got to step away and say, what in the world have I done? <laughs> because I get sucked in. There's something about a book on a nice day outside mm -hmm. or at the beach, because we still have days like that. Just spending time with God alone, there's, there's something special about that. And maybe I'm just old, but... Opening up a book and just having that relationship with the Lord and learning things is just such a, a, a wonderful thing, and it causes us to grow. So it's called reading. It's how people install new software into their brains, right? That was supposed to be a joke, you know. <laughs> people don't know what a book is, you know. There are a lot of things that younger people aren't going to know what they are, you know, like a key to your car. A key? What do you use that for? I got this thing in my pocket. I walk up to my car, it opens by itself. And, you know, as long as I'm in the car, it starts. It's just a button. What's that key for? You watch, it's coming. I, I said a long time ago, they're going to start charging us for water. And guess what? <laughs> Reading. Reading is how we download new information to our hard drive. It's the software that we need. And so uh, if, I, if I had to explain it to a tech person, that's the way I'd say it. But we're supposed to desire the pure milk of the word of God. I don't know how many, how many hours you're logging in the word of God, but it will make a difference when you're reminded of who God is and what he's done for you and who he's created you to be. And you don't even understand it all yet about what he's done, of what the spirit inside of you really means and the possibilities that it really could be, we don't, I, I think we're, we're not tempted by so many great things. We're just tempted by so many small things. And we're content to say yes to silly things instead of big things. It's not big things I have to worry about. It's the little foxes that spoil the garden, the scripture says. And so you have to watch out for that. But the milk of the word, to get into the word of God, to read it as it is, because it is the only book that will promise you that you will be changed to become more like Jesus. And isn't that what you want? That's what I want. That's what I need. That's what we just sang about. So desire the pure milk of the word. In Luke 18, 17, assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. We have to come to God with nothing in our hands, nothing to boast of, nothing of our own, but just, Lord, I need you to fix me. I need you to change me. I need you to erase stuff out of my head. And by the way, he's good about doing that. You know, the more I remember how, much, how angry I am at somebody, how they've hurt me in the past, the more angry I get. Is it that way for you? Yeah. It's like a fire you keep putting logs on. You know what happens when you don't put logs on anymore? The fire goes out. It's like words. You get somebody who's angry and you, you just keep speaking to them, you're not helping. More words, more trouble. You get in an argument, you guys don't know this? <laughs> more words in an argument, it just means more trouble. So learn to shut up. If you forget, I'll tell you. I'm just kidding. I would never say that publicly. So babies, we're to be like babies and desire the pure milk of the word. In Psalm 119, verse 11, the writer says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
all of 119 is all about the word of God and all of the benefits. And David is just going on and on and on about his desires and about how he loves the Lord. He loves his laws. He loves his precepts. He gives, and you read through 119 and you're like, wow, I'm a real schlep here because I don't, I don't have a love for God and his word like David did. Maybe that's why I have my life and he had his. But that passion that David had to write that psalm, it's looking at how important it is for God's communication to us, for us to change so that we might become more like him. In Psalm 119, 105, says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell me how I should walk and what I should avoid and where I should step. And it's going to enlighten my path ahead so that I'll be able to make right decisions. What happens if you don't have a lamp and a light? You, I do this when I get up early in the morning. Find the wall. Okay, I'm good. I, I have to have a reference, you know. Or I'm in the shower and I have, I have soap in my hair, but I'm going to shave at the same time because I'm already soapy. And I'm, I'm going to, I like, where's my, you know, and you go for the razor. But when you have a light and you have a lamp, you'll be able to see clearly, but without which you're just going to be groping around in the dark and you can have a lot of mistakes. I, I think of the story of the man who he had a, a built-in pool in his yard and uh, he went to go swimming one night before going to bed and he didn't turn the lights on. He just kept it dark. And so he got up there and um, got on the, on the diving board. He was ready to dive in and his wife flicked the lights on and he says, you don't, you don't have to do that. And he looks and the pool's completely empty. It was a built-in pool, a cement pool, and he was just about to dive into a 12-foot nosedive into the bottom of his pool because it had cracked. This is in California where everything breaks because everything's shaken. And it, it was such a good thing that she turned a light on. And when I heard that story, I thought about the Word of God. It's a lamp. It's a light. And it's going to help me to know where to go and what to do. And it's going to help me that I don't jump off things and go headlong into a concrete bottom. God's Word. Job 23, 12, Job says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said that God's word was more important to him than a meal. Not just an optional meal, but a necessary meal. Like I'm really hungry here. And he says, your word is more important to me than eating. The silence descended deeply that day. <laughs> you get the idea that maybe there's a, this hidden spiritual life that we're missing out on. That there's a heart change that should be occurring that we just don't have. That there's room for us to put some stuff off and have some things added to us. When I read the word of God, I'm inspired in that way. Once I get over the depression... <laughs> I go to God and say, God, I, I'm just not like this. You get, I want to be like that, though. So help me, right? And that's when things begin to happen. In 1 Corinthians 3, 2, Paul is uh, then referring to the, these immature Christians in Corinth. And he says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you were still not able he was speaking to the Corinthians and saying, listen, I'd like to give you some, some bigger things to chew on other than the milk of the word, the, the simple, necessary things. But you, you guys aren't ready for that. You're not ready for meat. So, and if you read that book, it seems pretty deep to me. Um, it doesn't seem like milk at all. But he said, I'm just telling you simple things. I, I can't even get into some of the finer things yet. In Hebrews 5, 12 to 11, we see the same idiom. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So you get the scripture saying we should be like babes and desire the milk. And, it goes, and then there's this other side which says you can't stay there though. You can't stay. It's a good place to start. And in fact, we will never run short of near, needing to hear the gospel, the basics. I, I don't know you, but I, I just love Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. Go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I am, I am an addict to the gospel. And I just, because it reminds me of all these things. I recently went through Matthew 5, and I was like, wow, 
I think I forgot half of this stuff. You ever do that? You go through your Bible. It's even better when you see notes and stuff and you go, wow, that's insightful. I wrote that? You ever, you ever do that? Go, go into an old Bible and there's all these notes and you're like, wow, I, need, I needed to hear that. Thank you, younger me. And of course, it's the Holy Spirit, right? And he speaks to us and we, we get things in our heart and we write it down. But sometimes we can drift away from that. We will never, ever overgrow the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you're a sinner, you need to be saved, you're in process, you're not a finished thing, and God wants to do incredible things in your life if you let him. It's all about cooperation. Verse 4. So coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, when you read through Peter, you're going to come to little sections like this that are just loaded with meaning and packed with analogies. He's saying a living stone. He's calling Jesus a living stone. I wonder if that's where the name Livingston came from. Because it's living. Hmm. A living stone. Now, you wouldn't think of a stone as being alive, right? They actually have living stones, stones that grow. It's rather interesting. I didn't bring up a picture because it was trivial and didn't think you'd be interested. But anyway, stones don't grow, right? They get wet. I mean, that stuff grows on them, but they don't, they're not living. You, you won't. You won't find, unless it's round, you won't find it moving, right? <laughs> unless you go into the desert some places, there's some stones that move. And anyway, living stone. So Jesus is this living stone. And I can't help but think about the temple in Jerusalem and how big that thing is. They have one stone that's 45 feet long. It's like 18 feet high. And it's, it's like 600 tons, which is a lot of weight. And you go, how in the world did they move this thing? <coughs> they found the quarry, actually, where they got the stones. And uh, they, they have writings, like Josephus writes about it, some of the other historians, about how they move these stones. Um, you'll see the little pockets. You see the little pockets in that stone? By the way, that's one stone. It's limestone. It's a big, giant one. They actually put boards inside there so that they can kind of push it along on, on logs. But anyway, I, uh, this is what I do. I spend late nights reading on things that I don't understand. We are coming to him as a living stone. In Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, it says, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, who is Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body of the edifying of itself in love. Now, if you can imagine, if you've ever gone to Jerusalem and seen the, the walls, these stones are so perfectly fit together, you can't put a credit card between them. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And none of it was done in the city of Jerusalem itself. It was all done at the quarry. Because there's a scripture in Kings that says that there was not heard the sound of a hammer or a chisel in all the temple area, which means all of these things were pre-fitted. This is a prefabbed house, okay? Except in stone that they did at the quarry. I just find that absolutely amazing. You know, we think people that are, that are old or lived a long time ago didn't have any intelligence. Well, you need to do some research. A living stone. You know, not only is Jesus a living stone, but he also says that we're living stones. Now, I can get that, you know, and, and to be able to get us to fit together with that precision that they do with these walls, you know what happens? We're, we're rubbing up on each other, uh, rubbing up the, the sharp edges of you are scratching on me, and the rough edges of me are scratching up on you. Like, hey, 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 go, 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 go. And that's how we get knit together. That's why it's so important to be in church. You know, you could put it on the internet. You could, you could put something on the internet and learn there, but you won't be with people. You're not going to hug your computer, I hope. 
you're not going to get one-on-one -on -one love from an individual human being if you do that online. It was one of the things that I noticed when COVID hit. Boy, I really missed people. I really missed being with people. And just the open interchange of what's going on in your life? What's happening? What, what's the Lord speaking to your heart about? What are you reading? What's happening? All of those kind of things. And you miss out on that interpersonal connection. Those kind of things polish us off on each other, right? So the living stones that we are, we end up being able to be fit together, as it says in Ephesians. You know, we're in process. We're all in the midst of being chiseled out as a living stone, a stone that doesn't, you know, if, if somebody meets you today, will you be the same person they met 10 years ago? I had, I, I had the auspicious um, burden of going to my reunion once and I didn't recognize hardly anybody. Like, who are you? <laughs> they didn't recognize me either. We should be changing, not just on the outside, but the inside. And the Lord should be making us new. We're all in the middle in a process. And it's interesting what God uses to form us, right? And to change our character. Sometimes it's tragedy. It could be a job loss or someone we love. And God polishes us off and makes us these living stones that we're always having to change. Some people don't like to change. How many of you don't like change? Don't like change. I'm going to take note of you. Yes. <laughs> No, no change, no change. Okay, I get that. I totally get that. There's some things I don't want to change. And then there's some things I want to change completely. And then there are people who want to change just for change's sake. And they upset everyone. I'm not one of those guys. I think we should change things from good to better and from better to best. And I, I think if we're going in that direction, everyone will agree and say, okay. You know, and, and just concede. In Hebrews 5, 8 to 9, it says, Though he was a son, speaking of Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Isn't it weird that Jesus learned? Jesus, who was God, God the Son, the Son of God, he learned. How does God learn? Because, see, God never poured himself into a human body and experientially walked life like you and I do. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Do you think Jesus is much different than us in that? If Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered, how do you think you're going to learn obedience? Just saying. And 1 Kings 6, 7 is the scripture I was speaking of that uh, at the temple when it was being built, was built with stone, finished at a quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. You know what that tells me? When you get to heaven, it's over. You see, this is the quarry where God is chiseling away at your rough edges and making you so that when we get to heaven, there'll be no more of that. We'll be finished instantaneously, he'll make us finished. We're not going to arrive finished. We're going to become finished by transitioning from here to the next life. And so I, that's the, when I read that scripture, I see that parallel and I go, wow, okay. I get why, you, you know, you read some of these things in the Bible, you go, why in the world do they say that little weird bit of information? And then sometimes the Lord just brings you uh, wisdom. <laughs> but all of that building together of the temple no noise was found anywhere in the, the temple precinct because everything was done off-site. Just like right now, you and I are going to be chiseled away at and changed by him. But when we get to heaven, it'll all be done and we'll all fit together. It says that Jesus, being this living stone, was rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up to be a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, spirit, uh, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's an interesting uh, bit of history. It's written that when they were building the first temple, that when all of the stones were being hewn and cut and they were sending them, there was a stone that arrived at the temple and they didn't know where it went. And so as they, put, as they put the temple together and they got everything together, they said, well, I guess this is an extra. <laughs> and they threw it, <laughs> they threw it into the valley, into the pit of garbage. 
into the into Gehenna because they figured it was it was a worthless like why would somebody take all this time to carve out a stone and you know the precision of all this and then the builders say no it doesn't fit it, it, this is a Tetris thing and uh, we know Tetris and no it doesn't fit here and they threw it into the valley of Gehenna which is the garbage dump they found out later it was needed they were building a tower, and they said, we're missing a piece. And the people who were chiseling, of course, you know, union guys, they said, we sent it to you. I got a bill of lading right here. You, you received it. But they didn't know where it went, so they threw it away. That's what this scripture is talking about. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, speaking forward about Jesus Christ, says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So you see, even like that temple stone that was saw, like, you don't, this doesn't fit anywhere. Jesus came, and he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. His own people rejected him. The Messiah, who was to come to the Jewish people, they were the ones who rejected him. We have to be careful we don't follow in suit. But... He was like that stone that was rejected, that was pushed aside. Do you think that you and I might experience the same sort of thing? Somebody says, so what do you do for a living? I'm very careful how I answer that question. How do you answer that question? So what do you do? Oh, I sleep, I eat, I wake up. I do lots of stuff. I usually tell them, I can't tell you or I have to kill you. But if they really care, and if they're really asking, I'll tell them. But I always get frosted flakes. I get, they say, so what, so what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh, oh, oh. I get the big oh. So that's why I hate to do it, because then they put on a mask, you know. It's, it's funny, I was praying for all you pastors just this morning. Okay, calm down, buddy. <laughs> Jesus was rejected as a stone in the foundation of the religion in which God handed to them and spoke about him coming. We are being built up to be a spiritual house. And so if you can imagine each one of you being one of those blocks, uh, that, that's actually the back end of the temple. We are being built up. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here this morning, right? Or, or watching online. And you guys are seeking to get built up. I, that's why I get into the word. Uh, there's some stuff that needs to get torn down. But there are some things I want to get built up. And I want to fill my mind with knowledge and, and my heart with joy and get to know the Lord better. Being built up. The Lord is in the midst of chiseling you and making you into his own image. Amen. Good. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I'd, I'd hate to think that there was someone here that wasn't. But when we commit our lives to him and say, Lord, I'm, I'm broken and I need you, he undertakes to do the project. He undertakes to rebuild us. And I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I struggle with them, you know, because there are things I don't want to let go of, like all the stuff in my garage. But it's time. And you come to the place where God gives you the grace to do it and you just say, it's time and you got to let these things go. But we're being built up to be a spiritual house. Now, you think of a spiritual house, you think probably the temple in Jerusalem might be what he's referring to. This was written previous to 70 AD. The temple was still standing. All those stones were still in place, and it hadn't been torn down yet. Um, so as he's writing this, I'm sure he's speaking about the temple in Jerusalem. And you think about all of the things. If you are a spiritual house, what are the kind of things that happened in the temple? The kind of things that happened there was you meet with God, you worship, you pray, you sacrifice, you serve, you have fellowship, you hear the word, right? All of these things. You, and some people call this building the church. But it's actually the people are the church. And in fact, each one of us is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because God doesn't dwell in, in a facility. He dwells in people. And so if we are being built up to be this house, then what, what is it that should be going on in my heart and my head? 
I should be meeting with God in a relational, conversational walk. I should be making sacrifices. I should be doing all of those things. Of course, the sacrifice for my sin was once and done handled by Jesus Christ and you as well. But there are things in, we should be, you know, letting go of little bits of granite that shouldn't be there, you know, and, and becoming more into his image. And so those are sacrifices that, that we're to perform, obviously. A holy priesthood. By the way, you guys are all in the ministry. You know that? You're no different than me. The scripture says that you are a royal priesthood. A holy priesthood, sorry, royals later. Holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. I don't know about you, but you ever think of yourself as a priest? You know what a priest does? A priest speaks to God on behalf of man. Do you speak to God on behalf of man? I bet you do. Well, if not, I'll add, add me to your list right at the top. Pray for Pastor Dave, because I need it. But you guys are priests. What else do priests do? They perform sacrifices. Are you guys dying to yourself for other people? Of course you are. Are you helping in worship? Are you, uh, you guys worship great this morning. I, I loved hearing your voices. We are all priests. There's this universal priesthood of believers of which we are. We minister to God. And so I pray for people. Then you pray for people. And we help people. And we do what we can. That's what God's called us to. And we're a holy priesthood, which means our life should look like we're ministers because we all are ministers. Amen? Amen. So we're these living stones. We're a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Instead of the temple, which actually had bloody carcasses of animals and those sacrifices were por performed, we have spiritual sacrifices, right? Amen. As a priest, we offer spiritual sacrifices, which is, you know, there are places I don't go, things I don't do, people I don't spend time with. There are sacrifices I make because that's what the Lord would want me to do. And uh, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price, just like you. Therefore, honor God with your body. So there are things that I don't put in my body anymore. We make spiritual sacrifices. Sometimes it's putting off and shutting my mouth and not put off that evil speaking. That's a spiritual sacrifice when you say nothing. You guys feel it too, don't you? Like a little piece of you dies. Like, oh. If they only knew. Right? That's a spiritual sacrifice. And, you know, God sees that and he loves that. When you, you know, when you don't smack somebody that deserves it, that's a spiritual sacrifice. I know, I know it's only the thing I struggle with, but you guys. <laughs> spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you know that the things that we do, people do all sorts of good things and they try to win God's favor. They try to get him to love them because they feel miserable about their sins because they're carrying them because they don't have a savior. And so what they do is, oh, I, you know, those giant scales in heaven where all my evil deeds will be put here. I, I got to throw something on this side in the account or I'm going to go to hell. I just know it. Th that scale doesn't exist. God loved us enough to send his only son to die for us so that all of the junk that goes on in our lives, he's forgiven and he makes us new. So it's all on this side, guys. It's wh whatever you do goes into the account. These spiritual sacrifices are things that God recognizes. Paul encourages us. He says, your, your labor is not in vain. Don't forget about this, guys. There's, there's going to come a day when we stand before God and give an account of our lives. And I don't want to look back and say, I wasted so much. I can't believe I wasted so many years. I feel like I just woke up 62 today. How about you? Well, maybe not 62, but you know what I mean. Like, where'd all the time go? I used to be young and, and fit. And I think I was a little taller. <laughs> Spiritual sacrifices is what we do because we love the Lord. And, and he's, our, he's our God, and we want to do what he wants us to do. In Psalm 51, you guys are probably familiar with Psalm 51. 
David repenting of his sin finally crushed in his heart about the way he was living in his life. And he says, for you do not desire sacrifice. He's talking about a physical sacrifice of an animal or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Now, isn't that interesting that he would say that in the Old Testament period? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, these, O God, you will not despise. Even in the Old Testament, it was recognized that those physical sacrifices weren't worth anything unless your heart was first sacrificed, unless you've given yourself over first. A broken and contrite heart. You know, some of us don't like to show that vulnerability of being broken and contrite about our failures. That's not biblical. Paul says, listen, I I prayed three times that the Lord would take this thorn in the flesh away. And he spoke to me and told me this. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Do you realize when we share our struggles, our vulnerability and our contriteness, that honors God. When you tell people, you know what, uh, I'm, still, I, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. I'm still trying to get this, and uh, I don't know why, but every morning I wake up like, yes, I'm going to tackle the world, and, and then I just don't, and I run out of gas, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. You know how authentic that is? You know how refreshing that is to a world that's got a mask on pretending to be something they're not? Let's be authentic people, because what God values is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. In this, there is no way that you'll be cast away from him if you come to him like that. Some of us don't want to go before God because we think, you know, he's going to throw lightning bolts at us, right? You know, I'm, I'm surprised when I walked in today that the place didn't set fire, you know. <laughs> Some of us believe that about God because we've had fathers maybe that way. And so we have a hard time reconciling who our father in heaven is. But here, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. He's asking God to bless uh, the, the city. Bless the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. You see, what he's saying is you got to get your heart right with God first. Because all the stuff you do on the outside, if your heart's not right, it doesn't mean anything. So what you do is you get your contrite heart before the Lord. You confess your sins as we confess our sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed, the scripture says. As we do that, we become equipped. We become equipped and not disallowed from being able to serve. But it's got to start at the heart. You've got to be willing to give him those things that he's asking for. Because if we don't, all of the other stuff that we do won't mean anything. I can can walk in this door and pretend to teach a class and and, uh, uh, teach the Bible. But if my heart's not right, this is going to flop and I'll be out of a job real quick. So if it's that way for me, I imagine it's that way for you too. Because everything else that we do comes from having a right relationship with God. If you have never come to the place where you said, Lord, I'm a failure. Your Bible, your scripture says that I'm a sinner and I get it. In my heart of hearts, I know that. Maybe other people think I got it all together, but I don't. And I need a savior. I need you to change my heart and change my mind and change my life because I've made a mess of it. If you've never come to that place, then you need to know Jesus. And he waits with open arms because a broken and contrite heart he will in no way cast out. So I just want to exhort you, if you have not done that, or if you're in a place where you've got something besetting in your heart, you can put that off right now. You can put it off right now and give it to the Lord and ask him for strength to repent and get the heck out of it. As the worship team comes up, I want you to pray with me. 
Heavenly Father, you know each one of us. You know the things that we struggle with. You know our imperfections. And yet, we know about your grace. We've read about it. We've sensed it in the past. And Lord, we prevail upon you to sweep through Grace Bible Fellowship, that your spirit might sweep through each one of our hearts, Lord, and restore us to a place of being 100% right with you, that our hearts would be contrite about the things that we do that we shouldn't, that we would be inspired to add those things, Lord, that you would have us add, that we would submit ourselves to your hammer and chisel as you make us into those living stones. I pray that you help us, Lord. Our minds and our hearts become contaminated by walking around in a dirty world. I pray that the hearing of your word and the moving of your spirit and the fellowship of this place, that you would work. You would work that which is pleasing in each one of us. So Lord, we commit this to your care. We look for you to move because we need it individually. We need it as a body. And Lord, our country needs it. So Lord, I pray that you help us. Revive us again for you in Jesus' name.